today I'm going to be discussing uh, the, some work um, on rehabilitation and reintegration of women and minors in Iraq. I've been involved in for the last uh, few years. And uh, if there we go, uh, and there we go. Um, so, based on this work, uh, I'm going to discuss some of our, our findings from this. But this work has included uh, several things that have pri uh, prioritized the rehabilitation and reintegration of ISIS-affiliated women and minors, um, both in Iraq and then uh, also on a, on a European uh, basis as well. Uh, this has included uh, the Project PREPARE, so the EU-funded Project PREPARE that I was uh, managing up until June this year, which looked at children in violent extremist affiliated families uh, in six European countries. And it's also included uh, quite a bit of work in Iraq we've been doing um, with our, our great partner, the IOM, um, over the last couple of years. So this has included um, uh, our partnership with them, where we conducted a series of roundtables on prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration. Uh, we conducted four of these last year uh, throughout Erbil and Baghdad with uh, key stakeholders involved in this process to get a better understanding of their, their needs and concerns around rehabilitation and reintegration. Uh, this excellent report, it's a very, very detailed and thorough report, is available on the ICTT website. Uh, this is also based on some independent academic work uh, I did um, in Iraq last year where I was uh, in the field interviewing ISIS-affiliated families in camps around Iraq. Uh, and that has uh, most recently come out in the uh, latest issue of Perspectives on Terrorism, so I'll be drawing from that as well. And it's also informed somewhat by a recent work I've done on Islamist governance, so um, focusing on how Islamists approach governance, which included how they engage with populations uh, such as women and minors. Uh, just to give you a sense of the, the methodology uh, around this, um, this has included, again, uh, primary source interviews with not only uh, these returnee families uh, across Europe and then also in Iraq, um, but also with practitioners and policymakers and security officials that have worked on the subject. Um, it has included stakeholder workshops with, um, with uh, people involved in every stage of the process, focus groups with returnees, uh, and extensive literature review as well. To better understand um, the situation of children, and uh, it was the uh, methodology used in the Perspectives on Terrorism paper, uh, I've drawn on Bronfenbrenner's biological or bioecological systems theory. And for those not familiar with it, uh, it is a, a theory which looks at uh, childhood development and considers uh, childhood development on different levels. So the micro level, meso level, exo level, and macro level. And it really helps, um, it's a really useful uh, model for thinking about how children's lives are affected on, on different levels and different interconnected levels uh, when their families are involved in violent extremism. It helps think about the, the effects uh, on their lives that are useful for uh, rehabilitation and reintegration as well. The model accounts for biological differences, include age and gender considerations and specific needs of children, including physical and uh, mental disabilities or abilities in terms of how that affects their development and also how that um, impacts their, uh, their interaction with the environment around them. So based on, uh, based on all that, today I'm going to discuss the situation um, in Iraq uh, around ISIS-affiliated families, so give just a brief overview of the current state of play. Uh, I will then consider what rehabilitation and reintegration needs are unique to Iraq and which are also shared beyond the borders of Iraq and discuss key gender considerations and policy recommendations. So uh, I'm sure most of us are quite familiar with the, uh, the current status of this, but just to give you a, a sense of this, the current situation um, in, um, in Iraq uh, and northeast Syria where a large uh, portion of this population is, um, is what I will be focusing on here. But I tend to focus on ISIS-affiliated families. And it's a very specific term that I use to talk about families who have a, an immediate family member who was directly involved in the group, but they themselves were not involved in the group. So we're talking about women and minors who have not had a formal role in the group. They have no charges or convictions against them, but perhaps a, a fa male family member, a husband or a father, for example, might have been an active member in the group. And due to that status of a familial involvement or affiliation, I should say, they are now going through some type of government-led process of return, rehabilitation, reintegration. What this looks like in northeast Syria today, uh, where there are approximately 46,000 um, residents still uh, in El Hol camp, um, of that 46,000, approximately 24,000 of those are Iraqis, and the majority of those are children. So this makes Iraq the, uh, the highest um, population case study in the world for ISIS-affiliated families and the highest population in, uh, in El Hol camp today. 
And in 2021, the, uh, the government of Iraq declared it will return this population. So uh, I think they should really be commended on, on the, uh, the forward-looking um, effort to really um, bring back those populations and ensure that they are rehabilitated and reintegrated. And currently, um, according to the Global Coalition through open sources, they highlight that this review process or this uh, process of return includes um, interviews with these individuals in a whole camp. So ensuring that uh, they, they have uh, adequate information about them. They verify their identity and ensure there are no criminal charges against any of these individuals. They then transport them to the, the Jeddah One uh, Rehabilitation Center in uh, Nineveh province in Iraq. Uh, and they spend uh, approximately three months there undergoing rehabilitation. Uh, upon uh, approval to go uh, back to the communities, they are then reintegrated. And it should be highlighted that, again, this is a, a civilian population. It is non-criminal. It is a voluntary return process. And the majority, 94% uh, of these are women and children. Rehabilitation in J1 today focuses on needs and ultimate reintegration of the population. And this reintegration uh, at the final stages is um, uh, integrated with a, a sponsorship program where they do have local sponsors to help facilitate their return as well. Uh, looking at how many have actually now returned to Iraq from uh, Al Hol camp, there's been approximately 5,500, just a little bit over that. Um, and 2,400 of those have occurred in 2023 already. So it is quite a, an active and ongoing process. But ISIS affiliated families are not only in Al Hol camp, they are uh, in several other camps as well across Iraq, though they have not gone to Syria. But these include uh, the Hassan Sham U2 and U3 camp, Khazar camp, and previously the J5 camp as well. So looking at this population, uh, it is a notable population. So besides the 24,000 in Al-Hol, there are tens of thousands um, of individuals who are considered from ISIS-affiliated families today. So in, in prisons right now, there is a, a notable population of approximately uh, a very large population of ISIS-affiliated um, persons on terrorism charges uh, in, the country, um, in prisons right now. And so when we talk about ISIS-affiliated families, it's looking at the entire family system around those individuals. So what are some of the, the features shared with women and children outside of Iraq? So again, I'm basing this on some of the work we've done in, in Europe and other contexts as well. And I think it's important to highlight this because it, it considers not only the shared features in other countries and contexts around the world, uh, it highlights uh, areas of shared um, effort and concern and um, consideration where I think uh, exchanging lessons on good practices is a very useful thing. Um, shared features include a very, very high number of female-headed households. So this is due to divided families where um, uh, male breadwinners in many cases are dead, missing, or in prison. Um, there has been uh, an extensive um, educational disruption experience for these children. Um, it is to the point now where some of these children have not even been in a proper school. Um, so this has occurred for, for many, many years now, and it is a shared feature for many of these children. There's also a shared feature of stigmatization of families, uh, and this can be expressed through bullying, societal impacts on employment, and so forth. Um, but stigmatization of, of these families is quite common uh, throughout all the cases that we've looked at. And generally, all of these populations have been perceived to require some level of rehabilitation and reintegration. And so these are often through government-led processes to rehabilitate this population. So what the ultimate aims and outcomes of rehabilitation are differ location to location. There's also limited uh, knowledge on the long-term outcomes of this process and what that ultimate uh, reintegration would look like. There's also several factors that are quite unique to Iraq, and this is quite important for, for thinking about the, the work being done there right now. Um, Iraq is a post-conflict environment. Uh, the, the population of Iraq has suffered greatly under uh, ISIS historically, um, and there are still a lot of grievances around um, uh, crimes that have been committed against the Iraqi population and other um, ways that that population has suffered. Those outstanding grievances are particularly acute for populations like Yazidis. Um, so for things like the Yazidi survivor law that, was, that has uh, been passed, but um, there's been some dispute about how um, sufficiently it's been applied. And there's been limited um, cases of transitional justice as well. There's also uh, the, the issue of Tabria, which is quite unique to Iraq. And what Tabria is, is a, is a, tribal, um, uh, it's a tribal system or program where um, individuals disavow family members. 
So what this has meant is that women from ISIS-affiliated families have been asked to undergo or um, in some cases uh, perceived to be coerced to undergo tabria and disavow male family members in order to get the documentation or be able to return home. So there are very gendered considerations related to the role of women returning there. There's also notable challenges uh, with access to documentation. Um, so everything from uh, being able to, um, to meet that burden of proof of documentation, accessing documentation, and all of this means that in terms of accessing everything from government pensions, healthcare, education, and so forth, there are notable limitations in how that, um, how that uh, population can, can carry on with normal life once returned to the community. There's also several notable barriers to return in the case of Iraq as well, which have included uh, risks of revenge attacks, limited housing, uh, and so forth. So in terms of gendered considerations, there's, there's several things that are, are very relevant to the case of Iraq. You know, gender considerations permeate each of these areas discussed so far, and it's one of the, the most useful um, intersecting categories that can better inform the unique profiles, needs, and barriers to rehabilitation and reintegration. But gender is not the only thing that needs to be considered, and a, a gender-conscious but also age-conscious um, uh, considerations have to be integrated at every step. These also have to account for things like the, the stage and level of development for children, the specific need and risk profiles that children may have and adults may have. And for children, they require individualized assessment and tailored rehabilitation responses, which focus on their well-being and ultimate reintegration, considering the trauma that they may have experienced, uh, their level of development, their gender, and really just trying to get these kids back to a normal life. Gender considerations also highlight the unique rehabilitation and reintegration considerations of women and minors in Iraq and the shared and unique features of rehabilitation and reintegration considered globally. So again, everything from the, the high number of female-headed households, uh, for example, uh, demonstrate that when we consider rehabilitation and reintegration, we must account for, for this particular um, profile. And a gender-conscious approach helps us to consider how these issues uniquely affect um, not only uh, women and children, but men and women, boys and girls, and how those can be responded to effectively in rehabilitation and reintegration work. So based on this, and again, this is a very kind of high-level overview for which I'm uh, very happy to discuss uh, more in the Q&A, uh, I would like to make three recommendations based on our, our current considerations. So the first, these are very general, but uh, I think the, the importance of really driving these, these points home um, makes it uh, important to, to really uh, reemphasize these. But the first recommendation is that age and gender conscious considerations must be embedded in every aspect of rehabilitation and reintegration work. The second recommendation is that rehabilitation and reintegration must also consider multi-level um, factors. So looking at not only the individual life of the child, and uh, the individual uh, adult, but also looking at the wider community, the, the micro, meso, and macro level um, considerations around them as well. The individual, the family, the community, the societal level considerations that would impact their ultimate and successful rehabilitation and reintegration. I really consider the interlinkages of those and accounting for those in a holistic approach to rehabilitation and reintegration. And the third is, and again, this is a, a, a standard one, but it is uh, particularly important, um, I think, but ensuring that these rehabilitation and reintegration efforts are adapted and tailored for the local context to account for local gendered considerations um, and barriers to social or economic impacts uh, and other uh, local considerations that might differ country to country. The long-term impacts and implications of ISIS affiliation on these populations are still unknown, but a gender-conscious approach can ensure that the most detailed and uh, tailored considerations are pursued. Thank you very much. <laughs>